this is Rick. In this introduction, I want to set up an explanation for the single bullet theory, perhaps the most famous of all JFK assassination controversies. Of course, it should no longer be a controversy, but in the truth averse world of today, good luck with that. The background to this single bullet theory is simple. The majority of witnesses, scholars, and investigators agree that there were three shots in Dealey Plaza beginning at 12.30 p.m., November 22, 1963. The first shot missed. It missed JFK, it missed everyone in the car, and it even missed the car itself. By looking at the reactions of the passengers from the subsequent two shots by using the Zapruder film, People have tried to time the spacing between the second and third shots because the film clearly shows that those two shots each hit one or more persons in the car. Nobody denies that JFK was killed by the third shot at frame 313 of the Zapruder film. And almost everyone agrees that Kennedy was hit earlier as well, as was John Connolly. The controversy is whether the second shot hit both men or whether the two men had their own bullets, so to speak, and the second shot was actually one of two shots fired from different guns at times very close to one another. If the latter was true, then there had to be a conspiracy, the definition of which is simply more than one person planning and committing the crime. This hypothesis arose because the two men reacted to the second shot, if it hit both men simultaneously, at different times. JFK is seen reacting no later than frame 225, and Connolly does not seem to react until frame 240. Those 15 frames in the Zapruder film represented almost a whole second, and it could have been slightly more than that if Kennedy had been hit earlier, a sign blocks the Pruder's view from frames 210 to 224. But the difference in reaction time would be too little for the same gunman to work the bolt on the rifle two times. So what other than two gunmen could explain this discrepancy in reaction times? There would have been no single bullet theory problem without the Zapruder film, because there would have been an assumption that two shots were fired at times sufficiently separate from one another for one person to get both shots off. But the Zapruder film was a time clock of the assassination because the film footage passed through the camera 18 times in one second. So there were 18 frames for each second and it was determined that no gunman could work the bolt on Oswald's rifle quicker than more than one and a half seconds apart. So it was simply impossible for Kennedy and Connolly to be hit by two separate bullets fired by the same gunman because it was impossible to work the bolt that quickly. So either the two men were shot by separate gunmen, which would be the textbook definition of a conspiracy, or one shot hit both men, in which case the single gunman theory would still hold up. The solution to this problem was set out by Arlen Specter for the Warren Commission, and this was virtually the only investigation that the Warren Commission did all by itself. Arlen Specter was the attorney who was in charge of this particular investigation. He showed that a single straight shot could have hit both men simultaneously at the angle of the car and the position of the two men relative to each other in the car because Conley was sitting in a jump seat that was situated lower than Kennedy's seat and also was several inches to the left of the right side of the car whereas Kennedy's position was right against the right side of the car. So a shot from the sixth floor of the Texas School Book Depository, a straight shot, would have been angled in such a way as to hit Kennedy in the upper back 
and Connolly in the right side of his back. Now, critics said that would mean that the bullets would have to change course in mid-flight, and they called it a magic bullet. But because the jump seat was situated to the left of Kennedy's seat, not directly in front of it, the shot would hit Conley on his right side, even though it was angled through Kennedy's right side. Connolly was situated too far to the left for the bullet to hit his left side. So that made sense. The bullet would only have had to shift course if Connolly was seated directly in front of Kennedy, which he was not. A true magic bullet was one in which the bullet would have suddenly disappear. In other words, if two shots separately hit both men, where did the bullet go that hit Kennedy if it didn't also hit Connolly? It would have had to land in the car, but the only fragments found in the car were fragments of the third shot which killed President Kennedy. Therefore, unless we posit the possibility of a bullet just disappearing in midair after hitting President Kennedy, we have to recognize that the single bullet theory has been unimpeached all these years. Or perhaps we should say it has been impeached in the same sense that a president can be impeached, but it has not been convicted in the same sense that a president has to be convicted once he's been impeached. There has been no proof whatsoever that the single bullet theory is illogical in any way. Critics then said, well, the bullet must have been planted. And indeed, there was nearly a whole bullet found on a stretcher at Parkland Hospital after the two men were brought into their respective operating rooms. The bullet was actually found on Connolly's stretcher, which makes sense, since the theory is that it passed through both men. But critics said, how could this bullet be undamaged, and some of them say pristine, if it smashed into Kennedy's upper back, penetrated his neck, and then hit Connolly's back, and then penetrated through the muscle, exiting out his chest, then going on to smash his wrist and embed itself in his thigh. It's a logical question, but it's only logical for people who don't know how ballistics work. And there's a very simple explanation. As a bullet slows down because it hits something in mid-flight, it loses velocity. And as hard as it may be to accept from a logical standpoint, a bullet that slows down is likely to suffer less damage even when it hits things like bone. And, of course, the bullet that hit Kennedy and Connolly, the single bullet, passed through Kennedy's muscle, tissue in his neck, did not hit a bone. Then, as it left Kennedy's body, it yawed and hit Connolly much, at a much slower speed and then went through tissue, not bone, until it finally hit his wrist, and then it hit the thigh, which was not bone. By the time it hit Connolly's wrist, it was traveling so slowly that it would not experience much damage as a consequence of hitting bone at that point in time. Again, it may not seem logical to the layperson, but it has been upheld time and time again, and even by experiments. So there's no magic bullet. There's no planted bullet. The bullet that hit both men would necessarily have been relatively undamaged. Although if you look at the bullet from the base side, you can see that there is distortion in the base. It is not a pristine bullet. So critics use semantics to try to gin up a controversy where one does not exist. And you cannot just posit the planting of a bullet on a stretcher at Parkland Hospital just to solve a problem that you have that the evidence suggests is not a problem at all. In other words, 
just to show that there was a conspiracy. You have to have evidence that it was planted. You can't just assert, well, maybe it was planted. Now, what about this time differential issue? Kennedy and Connolly reacting to their shots at different times. Now, remember, the single bullet theory would say that they were hit at exactly the same time, virtually. And yet, it appears that Kennedy was hit by the shot in question between frames 210 and 225 of the Zapruder film, whereas Governor Connolly was hit no later than frame 240. In other words, we see him reacting no later than to frame 240. We see JFK reacting no later than frame 225. Well, if we take the earliest frame where JFK could have been shot, which was 210, and the last possible frame that Connolly was shot, which was 240, we have a time of 1.82 seconds. And the professionals judged that the bolt action could not be worked faster than about 2.2 seconds at a minimum. So that's the issue of the time differential. And it's clear what the question is. It's not so clear what the answer is. But a little digging has provided the answer, and we've known about it since the 1960s. Once again, we have a controversy that's not really a controversy. What we now know is that JFK was struck in the back by a bullet that came very close to his spinal cord. It didn't sever the cord, but it came close enough to have vibrations that caused a spinal injury known as a Thorburn position. And that's where we see his arms coming up in the Zapruder film like this, where the arms are in front of his neck and chin. They never touch his neck. And from the Zapruder film, it looks like JFK is reaching for his neck. But in fact, he's going like this, never touching his chin or his neck. And those are the telltale signs of a Thorburn position which is an unmediated reaction by the spine. In other words, the reaction by JFK was not mediated by pain. And as we all know, when we knock our knee against a table or something, there's about a second between the time you injure your knee and the time that you feel it. A lot of times we'll say, oh no, that's going to hurt. And indeed, within a second or a split second, it starts hurting. Well, that's what happened with Connolly. Connolly did not suffer any spinal injuries, which would have had an immediate reaction upon him without some middleman like the nerve endings that send news to the brain that there's been an injury. In the case of Connolly, therefore, there was some time between the time that he was struck and the time that he felt the pain. And so that explains the differential between a reaction by JFK and one by Connolly at different times, but to the same bullet. It wasn't easy to see this on the Zapruder film because it was a very grainy film, and the film in the camera was very, very tiny. And so because of the graininess, it was difficult to see where Kennedy's hands were, and it looked like he was reacting to pain when, in fact, it was an unmediated reaction, unlike Connolly's. So that so-called controversy has been solved for decades. But these controversies, so-called, are continuously brought out of the attic and dusted off and presented as if they were something new when they're not new. It's just that the conspiracy theorists pretend that they're new or pretend that there have never been answers to these questions when the answers have been quite abundant. So much for the single bullet theory. Thanks for watching. Bye.